Next speaker is Sarah Martel, and she will give us a talk about Apogee and uh, Globla clusters and Halo assembly. Hey, good slides. All right. Hi, good morning. Um, yes, yeah, so my name is Sarah Martel. I am a senior lecturer at the University of New South Wales in Sydney. Uh, and this morning I want to talk about a series of projects that we've been working on uh, aiming to understand uh, the role that globular clusters play in, in building the halo of the Milky Way and by extension spiral galaxies in general, uh, the most recent uh, iteration of which was published this year in the AppJ. So the overall context for this uh, is that you know, it's axiomatic that galaxies grow hierarchically. Galaxy halos grow by accretion. We see this in models. Uh, we see this looking at nearby spiral galaxies. We see substructure on all scales. Uh, and for the most part, this is how it works. But that's the, not the entire story. Right? At some level, we know that the globular clusters are currently donating stars to the halo. So this is a map around the, uh, the globular cluster Palomar 5, which is a very low mass cluster. It lives here. It's fairly low density. But when you search the field around it for stars that look like they are consistent uh, with belonging to the population of the cluster, so they have the right temperatures, gravities, distances, velocities, that sort of thing, what you find are large tidal tails. So all of these other points out here are stars that originally belong to this cluster and are, are dissolving out into the field or being lost. And with another one or two orbits around the galaxy, those stars will drift off further. They will be no longer physically associated with the cluster. You would never know they came from there. But, and, and so the, the question of, of the total contribution of globular clusters to the halo is a little bit difficult to address just from this point of view, because once these stars become physically dissociated, how would you know? Uh, and the answer is that you can use chemical tagging uh, to identify stars that originally formed in clusters and then dissolved into the field. And, and through that process, uh, you can understand how much of a contribution stars that formed in clusters have made to, to the halo. So uh, the idea of chemical tagging, uh, well, it can mean a number of things. Uh, and ultimately, all you're trying to do is to use the elemental abundance pattern of a star to say something about where and when it formed. Uh, but you can be more or less precise in this. So at a very coarse level, you can do things like distinguish the thin disk and the thick disk. Uh, and, and that's more of a population assignment uh, kind of chemical tagging. Uh, but you can also try to be a lot more precise uh, and, for example, try to match stars that should have formed in the same a molecular cloud in the same star formation event. Uh, and so when people go looking for stars that formed with the sun, that's an example of this more fine scale chemical tagging. Uh, what we'll be doing, what I'll be talking about, is this, this more of a, a rough chemical tagging. We just want to say, you know, did the star come from a globular cluster in general, uh, but not, not try to be precise about which one. So in order to do chemical tagging, uh, there are two things that you absolutely have to have. And one of them is a distinct abundance signature. Uh, and the other one is the correct data set. So if you want to distinguish the thin disk from the thick disk, you're going to need to look at disk stars. If you want to find stars in the halo that came from dwarf galaxies, you're going to want to observe halo stars. Uh, in the case of wanting to understand cluster contributions to the halo population, uh, you need a large data set. Uh, we assume that uh, the, the overall population, uh, contribution of clusters to the halo is fairly small. And so uh, as a result, we expect that it should be a fairly small fraction of, of halo stars that we should be able to chemically tag. And so the most important consideration really is to get a lot of stars to search in. Because when we started this project, we had no idea. Uh, I mean, people had tried this before and not found anything. Uh, and so we just, you know, the, the, the best consideration for this project is to get a big sample. So um, in this talk, these are three data sets that um, we've used, that have been used for this kind of project uh, that I want to mention specifically. And they all have quite a lot of stars in them. Uh, and that is, uh, and quite a lot of halo stars at that. And so that is um, fundamentally what makes them useful for this project. Uh, the, the distinct abundance signature that we can use to tag stars back to globular clusters uh, is the fact that globular clusters have this very unusual behavior in their light element abundances. 
Uh, I am not going to get into why this is true at all. That's, that's not just a whole other talk, that's a whole other conference. But um, take, it as, take it as given that uh, in globular clusters, there's this pattern where some, for about two thirds of the stars, uh, the carbon, the oxygen, the magnesium are depleted. The nitrogen, sodium, and aluminium are enriched. And that this is uh, something that we see in every cluster, but it is not something that we see in other components of the Milky Way. So we can use this as a signifier that a star formed in globular clusters if it shows this pattern. So the way that we observe this is uh, generally in, in uh, planes, in anti-correlations. So this is a, a classic example. This is oxygen abundance versus sodium abundance. Uh, the crosses are all field stars, red giants in the halo, and uh, the other symbols are stars from various globular clusters. Uh, and the important thing, the reason that you can do this chemical tagging process, is the field stars are confined to this part of the parameter space. So they never get oxygen poor, they never get very sodium rich. While the cluster stars, some of them live where the field stars do, about a third of them, uh, but the rest of them extend out in this anti-correlation to this, this part of abundance space where the field stars can't be found. So the idea is, if you find a star with abundances up here, low oxygen, high sodium, or low, uh, low carbon, high nitrogen, or low magnesium, high aluminium, that's a very good indicator that that star formed in a globular cluster. Uh, and so the idea is, if you have a cluster full of stars and you dissolve it, or you have it undergo some amount of mass loss, right, some of these stars will escape, and you'd never know, you'd never find them because they'd be chemically invisible, uh, but these stars would also go into the field and take their abundances with them, and so you can find them again later and tag them back to a cluster origin. Now, like I said, this happens in, in all the clusters that we've studied, so this is from a, a, a survey using the VLT that looked at 19 different clusters in the southern sky, and in all of them, this is again oxygen, sodium space, uh, in all of them there is some amount of this anti-correlation. So this is a fairly reliable chemical tag uh, of stars having formed in globular clusters. Uh, oh, <laughs> word fell out of the box. Uh, the trick being, like I said, any, any, the one third of stars that have ordinary light element abundances, once those go out into the field, you'd never find them again. So you're only detecting the, uh, the chemically taggable stars, the ones that are, that are different from the field. So the first time we went to do this project, uh, we went, the, the available large data set was the Sloan Segway project, which is a low resolution spectroscopic survey. Uh, the first version of it had 150,000 stars. There was an extension that put that up to almost 250,000. Uh, and it did not report a lot of abundances. And so chemical tagging without abundances is a bit of a trick. Uh, but uh, in low resolution spectra, there are very nice indicators of carbon and nitrogen abundance. Uh, without having to actually directly measure abundance, there are molecular features of CH and CN. CH abundance is uh, band strength. Absorption here is driven by the carbon abundance. And the CN absorption is driven by the nitrogen abundance. And so the pattern that we're looking for is if the CH is weak, the CN is strong. If the CH is strong, the CN is weak. And so we, we went and pulled red giants, halo giants, out of Segway, and we got about 2,500 stars. And we went and looked at what the CNCH behavior is. So again, this shows you basically nitrogen abundance, and this is basically carbon abundance. And this is divided up by metallicity for reasons. I mean, uh, the, the, the band strengths obviously are, respond differently to abundances at, at different metallicities. Uh, and what we found is that 49 of these all these red dots, uh, compared to the field, are relatively nitrogen-rich and carbon-poor. Now, the vast majority of field stars are normal field stars, which is not a surprise, uh, but it, it does sort of show why this project was not possible uh, before. Right? This is a fairly small fraction. This is 2.5% of the stars that we looked at. Uh, and so it's only because we had a, a fairly large sample to start with that we feel that this is a very solid identification of this new this, this subpopulation of the halo. If you had looked at 100 stars and found two, 
that looked nitrogen rich and carbon poor, it would be hard to say with confidence that's, you know, those are distinct. Uh, but once, once you have a few thousand stars and you start finding tens of them that are chemically different, then you can be a bit more confident. Oop. Yeah, so anyway, this is the first time that this, this as a subpopulation, had been identified uh, as a, a part of the halo that had formed in situ. So, uh, Right, so we've done a, a few versions of this project have been done. Uh, we went back with, with Segway 2 when they expanded and, uh, and did the same process and found the same result, about 2% of the field. Uh, there have been a couple of literature compilation papers uh, doing other things with halo stars uh, that have nevertheless found stars like this. So this is from a project that was looking at the distinction between the halo and the thick disk. Uh, but what they also found were a couple of halo stars with low oxygen and high sodium. Uh, but with two stars. Uh, it's like I said, it's hard to be very confident that that's a distinct population, but it, it has basically the same statistics, finds the same sort of result. In Guy Iso, Karen Lind, oh no, the figure is terrible. It's beautiful in the paper. Um, and Karen Lind did this, found one star in Guy Iso that's very magnesium poor and aluminium rich. And this is a comparison to globular cluster data also from Guy Iso, uh, showing that it, it fits very well with cluster populations. Uh, and so they find sort of a similar fraction of stars. Uh, the, the latest version of this that was published this year was to do this same project, uh, but in the Apogee data set. So Apogee is a Sloan project that um, observed quite a lot of stars and returned abundances. And the really great thing about the Apogee project uh, is that it observes in the infrared. And so extinction and reddening are so much less of a problem than for optical surveys. What Apogee does is they look right down in the plane of the Milky Way. So this is a map in galactic coordinates of all of the targets that they want to do. Uh, so the orange are the ones that they have done. The blue are the observing program for the next few years. And the yellow, they're building a second spectrograph and putting it in Chile. And this is the observing plan once that gets working. And so you see that they can go right through the plane of the Milky Way apogee is going to be amazingly important for understanding disk structure. Uh, but they also spend a lot of time in the halo. So it's a great data set uh, for understanding uh, the assembly of the halo. Uh, so what we did was, again, to go and, and grab red giants, uh, halo stars out of the data set. We ended up with about 200 of them. Uh, and look for stars that looked like they're in the part of light element abundance space where cluster stars live and field stars don't. Uh, and so one way to select this is on nitrogen. So this, um, this would be a companion paper that was also recently published, looking toward the inner galaxy instead of the halo. What they find is that the vast majority of field stars follow this locus, but there's a small fraction that are nitrogen enriched. Now, that's one of the globular cluster signs. So we do that in the halo sample, and we find a similar thing. There's a small fraction of, of these stars that are nitrogen rich, but that's only one element. We've got you know, a, a large set that are useful for this chemical tagging. Uh, so when we expand into nitrogen and aluminum, what uh, Field stars sort of occupy you know, a, a predictable, smallish part of this abundance space. When you throw globular cluster stars on top of that, you see that some of them fall where the field stars do, and some of them extend out toward high nitrogen, high aluminum. Uh, and so when you put our stars, which are the red ones, on top of there, uh, these are the nitrogen-rich stars. They're also aluminum-rich relative to the field. Uh, and so we end up uh, with five stars out of about 200. Uh, that we feel are reliably chemically taggable back to globular clusters out of this data set. So that's, again, the same fraction. It's about 2% of the halo. So there are three points to really take away from these projects, right? And the first one is that there, there really is a subpopulation of the halo that was not accreted. So it's axiomatic that halos form through accretion, but it's not the entire story. Uh, and it's about 2% that can be chemically tagged. The second thing, and this is a thing that we've only realized in this most recent paper, there are as many chemically taggable cluster stars in the field as there are still in clusters. So if you take 2% of 10 to the 9 solar masses and you compare it to 2 thirds of the 150 globular clusters that we have, you get out about the same number of stars. Uh, and so that means that mass loss from globular clusters is actually pretty significant. Right? Either they've all lost about half of their stars to the field, 
or uh, some fraction of them have completely dissolved, and the rest of them have lost some smaller fraction of the field. The third point is the trickiest one. Uh, converting this chemically taggable fraction of a few percent into a total fraction of, halo of cluster stars that in the halo uh, is actually very dependent on how you think globular clusters formed. There are models uh, that require that they used to be 10, 20, 50 times more massive than they currently are, uh, and that all of those extra stars would be chemically identical to field stars. Uh, and if that were true, then our few percent of chemically taggable stars would become as much as 50% of halo stars, which is impractical. That seems, that seems a bit much. Uh, but that, that conversion factor is a bit unconstrained uh, because models for how globular clusters form and how they get these abundance behaviors in the first place are currently pretty unconstrained, too. So thank you. Sir, do we have any questions or comments? Tiaki? Yeah, so the signature high nitrogen and aluminum, that's very simple. Theoretically, it's simply hydrogen burning. But the site is unknown, either AGB or a rotating massive star. There is no uh, model which can explain the, the oxygen to sodium anti-correlation in globular clusters. And anyway, it's a secondary effect, not primary effect. So there may be a time delay to get the signature. So the, it may be also possible that, that the first generation of globular cluster population don't have the signature. So uh, do, you, do you have any comment on maybe some underestimate of the fraction in the data or something? Yeah, so I was trying to stay out of talking about uh, models for how globular clusters get their abundance variations. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of the models go back to chemical feedback from stars, from AGB stars or massive stars or something, uh, because the signature looks very much like hydrogen burning, the CNO cycle and the neon sodium cycle and all of that. Um, but any, any feedback model um, doesn't work in detail. Uh, any feedback model that gives you two generations can't explain the clusters that have five. Uh, and when you look at the photometry and, and, and you know, the branches split off into three or four or five groups, and there are no two-generation feedback models that should produce that. So it, as far as I'm concerned, it's a giant question mark right now. I don't think there's any good model. Yes? In the back? Oh, sorry. Yeah, OK, go ahead, <laughs> since you have the microphone. OK. Uh, are there any differences in between uh, metal poor, metal rich collaborative clusters that you can use in chemical tagging? That you can use in chemical tagging? Right, like chemical abundance patterns or differences in the light elements? So, uh, this I, naive question, maybe. Yeah, so as a rule, uh, the, the anti correlations are more extended at lower metallicity, but they do not go away when you get a high metallicity. So if you look at clusters in the bulge, uh, where you would actually need a large mass of you know, nitrogen or, or sodium or something to create this abundance difference, you still see it. Um, so whatever the process is, it still works at high metallicity. Uh, but the, there aren't different patterns that show up. I guess at really low metallicity, you also see silicon participate. Uh, but that's kind of the only difference. I think we had another question here. Yeah, just. <laughs> so the last point in your summary, we have this problem with globular clusters that they may have been much larger at birth. Yep. And so wouldn't your investigation be able actually to test this uh, theory? Because if so, then you would expect many more uh, stars that the globular clusters have lost. So the models that say they were much larger originally um, so also require that all of those extra stars were first generation. They're chemically the same as the halo field. Oh. So you wouldn't be able to find them. Uh, but you can test this anyway by looking at, at special environments. It's a couple slides through. Um, this one takes a minute to load. Uh, if you look at, for example, there was a study that looked at the 4 next dwarf galaxy. Uh, where the field 
Come on. There we go. Uh, where well, the field metallicity distribution is not very metal poor, but all of the globular clusters are metal poor, uh, almost, except for this one. Uh, and so the test here is to say, if these clusters had lost a factor of 10 or 20 in mass, uh, would you be able to hide that in the field population? And the answer is no. Uh, you can only lose uh, sort of a factor of five in f of mass from these globular clusters. That's how much bigger they can have been uh, before you produce more field stars than exist. So, yeah. A okay. uh, final question there. That's really great. Thanks. Um, I'm wondering about at what middle of city, uh, how far down it goes. Like, at what point do we have this 2% number constrained to? Ah, so these uh, studies were all done in the range between minus 1 and minus 1.8. Okay. Uh, and that's for totally technical reasons and not science reasons. Uh, when you're doing the CN and CH work, the molecular bands um, kind of go away. They're not useful below minus 1.8. Uh, in the Apogee data set, the abundances become quite unreliable at low metallicity, again, because the lines just get too weak. Okay, with that, let's thank Plus Sire again. <laughs>